Uh, hi everyone, and uh, yeah, I will get started with my uh, lightning talk. Um, so, uh, first of all, just a brief introduction, introduction to myself. So I'm one of the PhD students here at the uh, Avatar University. Previously, I worked as a web developer in a startup environment back in Germany, uh, where I'm originally from. And like before also starting working as a developer, I already had interest in security and especially like the, uh, like the topics that intersect both with development and security, which led me to this path of looking more into intrusion detection and also deception techniques. Um, so I'm directly jumping in to the topic of the talk today. Um, I want to start actually with the title that I chose because uh, when I was thinking um, also during writing my PhD thesis, uh, because it's more a software engineering uh, topic, which I think, and what are like some related techniques or approaches that exist out there. And if you have come across like defensive uh, coding or programming. So this is mostly about uh, building software applications that uh, can still operate normally in the face of um, unforeseen events or can also uh, recover from any error stages. And I was thinking this is actually a super cool thing to have like as a capability in an application. And how can we like also use that like for security purposes? So having capabilities built in your application um, that understands like indicators of attacks and can do something uh, at that moment. So there are um, actually two or two ways which I'm going to um, present here in this slide. So the first one, and you can perhaps see on the, on the based on the examples uh, here in the code, so it's more about looking at very uh, distinctive indicators rather than using signatures. And you can either choose to invent your own indicators, so basically honey tokens, and you can pick up any web security resource you're familiar with and then choose like those locations uh, that are usually uh, like the target during a web application security assessment, for example. So any suspicious looking parameter, like a debug parameter, where you know that an attacker most likely will play around with that. Um, the second approach is, so for me also speaking as a developer, um, also very interesting because that's when I was coming across the first time when I um, read, read about the OWASP AppSensor project. And the idea that they promote is, to make use of existing or built-in validation controls in your application because they are also exception handlers because they will most likely, uh, or in many cases, they will already look for certain things which are interesting from a security perspective. So in that example here, um, the client, uh, so I'm checking here if a hidden input has been changed because a client should normally be not able to actually change any hidden input. So that's not uh, part of what a normal user should, uh, should be able to do. And here you can um, actually then start thinking, okay, this might be a user who has like an interception proxy and uh, plays around with the request. So, the other question is, of course, why should like a development team or developer invest into this approach and why is it actually something worth doing? And I think, um, if you have reached like a point where you have some security controls in place, then you also want to consolidate the knowledge that you think you know about your security controls or about the security uh, posture of your application and with those detectors in place, so you have, they can take like different roles or they can be like smoke detectors telling you that there's something uh, going on that you should be aware of. Or in the worst case, they can be like fire alarms saying, hey, your application is actually uh, experiencing a, a severe security issue. And um, like while looking for uh, 
good examples like in, in the practical world. I was coming across this talk by Zane Lecky on, uh, so this was a keynote talk from DevSecCon. He was pointing out in one part of the talk on this idea of having continuous feedback uh, coming from like real events from a production environment and also to make them visible. And I found this example really uh, like interesting also as a like milestone to achieve from a development perspective that you can really um, be in a position where at the point where you have like an exploit, a successful exploit that you can know about this and also fix that issue. And in this example, they were uh, able actually to fix it right before uh, the bug bounty hunter was able to email them. So I found this uh, really cool. Uh, and yeah, um, I think when you are attempting to answer that question, you perhaps also start thinking, yeah, how am I going to start with this? And I think a good starting point um, can be the frameworks that your applications are most likely built with. And this is also so a part of my research, which I'm focusing on, like to what extent can uh, frameworks be uh, helpful to achieve this or to achieve to implement this approach. And I'm just showing a very small uh, demo application, um, which is based on a framework called Lumen. Um, so the application is really uh, straightforward. There's two endpoints. Um, both of the endpoints are displaying data in different formats. So uh, is this, yeah, one has a CSV and the other one has a JSON and so the database has some entries which have, which you will see um, here, some entries starting with an equal sign. Because this was a situation I had um, in one of my first uh, penetration testing uh, experiences, so from a developer side speaking. Um, so they had tried out different forms of CSV injection. It was not vulnerable. But it turned out to be at a later time after the pen test, a code change was applied, which could have made it vulnerable if we were not like looking for what the testers have been doing during the pen test. And here I was thinking uh, to show that um, how we can actually like implement a detector for that using the event system, which is part in many frameworks. Um, here I have the controller that is actually doing the, uh, the displaying that you saw before. So it's really very straightforward. Just grabs data from a database, plugs it into a uh, exporter. And if you notice, this is being passed. Uh, so the export is not created here inside. It's being passed into the method of the controller. So that's uh, going to be important. And I will explain later why. Um, so the JSON endpoint is also similar, has a SQL injection vulnerability, uh, which is triggered by a URL parameter. Um, that's the second example I'm going to show. And here that's really straightforward, so nothing um, complicated, just displaying a comma separated value. And at this point, we could already start like adding detection logic to it. But you might want to consider if that's like the right approach, because this could also be coming from an external library, for example. And if you will start then updating your library or dependencies, that logic might go away. Or it might also not fit uh, together with the other part um, of the code. So instead of doing it right here, um, what you can do is you create a decorator or a wrapper around that exporter. So that gives you the possibility to extend the original functionality. And in that case, I'm adding here a formula check, which is then using the framework's uh, event system to say, hey, I have detected here a record starting with an equal sign and then telling that to 
whatever is subscribing or listening to my uh, suspicious events. In that case here, that's where you say in the framework who is going to receive these events. Um, yeah, so that's, um, remember when I said it's uh, important why it is being passed into the method? Because when your controller or any part of your framework-based application requires a dependency, it will, uh, that's where the dependency injection container will kick in. And you can actually utilize that container to say, whenever someone wants us or something wants a C, uh, CSV exporter, please return back this decorated one. So that has the advantage instead of like replacing all instances in all different locations uh, by hand. So you're doing it just in one place. And I think it's a much cleaner uh, solution. So this is uh, what the subscriber is basically doing, uh, what I will show in the next step. So it's just displaying this uh, notification that it has found some uh, entries. So it's listening here for the uh, event. And that's what the handler is basically doing. So you can, of course, do other things like uh, forwarding to a, another log system or, um, yeah, so the, the, it really is limited by, by the technology you're using or the uh, systems that you have in your environment. Um, another interesting thing is uh, a lot of the frameworks come also with the testing uh, facility or um, testing systems. Providing also, like um, in that case, the components to test also like your event system or um, trying to. So what, what I'm trying to get is uh, you may want to test it locally before you push everything to production because you also want to see if um, that different version that you now created, like the decorated one, if it's actually really firing in an event. event and basically verifying with your uh, common unit, unit testing tools in that case, which you are using in your application if, if the newly developed uh, exporter actually works. And that's something that you can add to your um, like existing test pipeline or to the tests of the uh, running in the test pipeline. So in the second example, I was thinking about um, another approach, which is more supposed to be used during development. And frameworks also come, um, some frameworks also come with built-in events, so you don't have to develop them yourself. So in that case, um, for example, when I hit a specific endpoint, it tells me if a query was executed, like a database query. And that contains the SQL query. So what I was thinking, because I uh, I got this, or was inspired by an article on a vulnerability scanner where the scanner talks with an agent sitting inside an application and basically telling, hey, you are right now, whatever you hit, it executed a query. You might want to try a SQL injection on that endpoint. And I was thinking to what extent can we also do that with uh, like what the frame, what the framework can provide for us. So remember when I said there is like this title parameter and in that notification. Um, so that's basically what, what comes from the, from the event. And what I was also trying to do, uh, which is, um, called taint inference. So I'm trying to see if whatever is uh, submitted by the user input is reflected in the query because that will tell me, okay, there are some parts in the query which I can take control of. And, oh, sorry. Oh, it's not running, okay. And the approach that I take is normally, um, if you look up for different taint inference approaches, they will um, use at some point a parser. So in that case, a SQL parser. I try to see uh, like how far I can come without using a parser. So my naive approach here is 
basically splitting the SQL string uh, based on white spaces and also some like special characters like equal uh, character that bind together two values just to be able to have like separate strings that I can check for similarity with the user input. And you can see here it's not completely um, like it's not completely error prone because there are po uh, false positives if you use uh, words or SQL keywords like uh, select. It will mark you here. Uh, this one also has tainted, although it's only this one here which is control. Um, I think what I learned from from that article that I mentioned and also other uh, what others suggested, like you can use just a dedicated value where you know this is never going to be part of a SQL keyword. So in that case, I'm using here zero x foo for example, and yeah, so I. So that's the that was actually the demo that I wanted to show, and I think um, even if if that um, so I just so even if that taint inference approach doesn't uh, like is not, uh, if it turns out to be not not like uh, fully useful the use what you can pull out from that just by knowing okay when you visit certain endpoints. You can already grab some information like, okay, this is firing a HTTP request here. This is interacting with the database. This is interacting with another microservice, for example. That's where you can start with a lightweight threat model, actually. And you can also start then suggesting things like what controls should it actually be covering at this point. And, and you can also start pointing your attack tools more, more directly. So, um, so my last slide is more about uh, my actual research. So I was more talking about frameworks right now. Um, so because from a, it's like when we consider like OWASP and like the, I think it's currently on the top nine, like on the ninth uh, entry, like insufficient logging and monitoring and. Uh, what I'm trying to uh, investigate is to what extent can frameworks actually help us to close that gap uh, regarding insufficient blogging and monitoring. And uh, part of it was because what you saw in the demo app and also uh, what controls are already existing inside. And so I basically want to see to what extent we can take advantage of that. And in my second main project, I'm more looking into um, so this started with the idea by looking like at attacks like SQL injection, and you know that for a successful exploitation, um, especially for a target which you don't have access like to the source code, you will have multiple failing attempts like uh, to get a working exploit, or, or until your payload gets fine tuned and actually. Um, executes its actual payload. And during that process, now the question is, can we take advantage of that? Like, um, because it will cause a lot of exceptions inside the application. And can we use those exceptions for defensive purposes? Kind of like, uh, like the fire alarm, uh, analogy that I, uh, was using previously. Yeah. And. That's uh, my talk. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, then. No questions. Okay.